Doug Cosmo Clifford, welcome to A Breath of Fresh Air. What a treat to meet you. How are you doing? I'm doing well, and, and how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good too. Um, I've got a bit of a sore throat going on, but otherwise I'm okay. That that lurgy is still everywhere, isn't it? I just uh, flew in from Sydney yesterday and I wore my mask most of the time, but not all of the time. And uh, I've woken up not feeling great. Anyway, shit yeah. happens, as they say, doesn't it? The shit does happen. Yeah, it sure does. You, you've certainly had your your lot of shit over the years and, and good times. There is so much to talk to you about. And I wonder if you wouldn't mind. I don't think we're going to, they're going to throw us off Zoom in 40 minutes. I don't know how much time you can spend with me. But if we don't get to the end of it, would it be okay just to click back on for another few minutes? Sure. Oh, you're awesome. You're awesome. Wow, who knew that you guys in, in Credence were such good guys? I had a chat with Stu oh, probably a couple of years ago now in the middle of the pandemic, and he was pretty awesome too. John was the only one who, who wasn't so awesome, it seems. But anyway, we, we, we can talk about that. Um, Doug, we've got some, I, I'll call you Cosmo because that's what you like to be called. Everyone calls you Cosmo, right? Uh, all my friends do, that's for sure. Well, if... if uh, I'm going to call you Cosmo too then. Yes. That will be great. There is so much to talk about. You've got a new album out, which is sensational. Um, there's a documentary on Netflix at the moment, which I've had a look at, which I, I want to talk about too. And, of course, there's a book out about Creedence Clearwater Revival. So um, I don't think, uh, well, you probably were busier in your day, but you're pretty busy these days too, right? I'm pretty busy. I've got my own record label now cliff song nice yes. and i've got a, a distributorship uh, from sony uh, bob frank so i've got uh, all the that the tools that i need for that side of the, the coin the label won't be bossing me around that's for sure <laughs> and and uh, in my 60 years of being under contract as a musician, it'll be the first time in 60 years that I won't have to audit my record company. Wow. Big changes ahead. I'm not going to sue myself quite yet. <laughs> so this, let's start with the new record. It's called California Gold. You actually recorded it back in 1968, in, in 1978, and... Uh, you recorded it at the time with Bobby Whitlock, from who who was uh, we all know well from Derek and the Dominoes, right? Right, that's correct. Yeah. So, so, what happened to the record that we never saw it at that time? <laughs> well, I have a, a little uh, vault, and in fact, it's uh, uh, called Cosmos Vault, and I have uh, a lot of uh, great musical projects that didn't come to fruition back when so better late than never they sound as good as they did you know 40 50 years ago so i'm, I'm uh, uh taking this project now with bobby singing i think he's the best he's ever sung i i i, I made him stop smoking cigarettes did you with, <laughs> with me and and i made him uh then i i got him on a running program so because I'm an athlete, I'm always getting you know, in shape and uh, running around. So uh, his instrument is, is, is his throat and wind is, is critical. And uh, he, you know, he, I knew if he could do more, uh, anybody could if they got rid of the cigarettes and, and he did and he actually started liking to run. <laughs> <laughs> really? So um, are you talking about recently this has happened or back in 1978 when you re uh, reconfigured yeah. Bobby Whitlock? Yeah, many moons ago. Right. Uh, so you you the... set him you set him on the straight and narrow. Yeah. And he was glad I did. I bet he was. He's, I, I guess he, he could owe you the fact that he's around and healthy today. He was another one I had a chat with again probably a couple of years ago. Uh, and he's still doing some fabulous things. So when this record, um, when it first came out, where were you at at the time when you pulled uh, Bobby Whitlock and, and Donald Dunn into it? Well, uh, it was r right around that time. I, I was at Duck's house, and uh, and I, I told him that I wanted to start a band and I'm busy 
and did he know any singers of merit that might want to work with me? And he says, yeah, uh, Bobby Whitlock. And I said, well, that rings a bell. And he says, Derek and the Dominoes, Layla, all that. And I said, oh, of course. So anyway, we, uh, Bobby drove up to my house from, from L.A. He was broke, uh, had a pregnant wife and a, a three, three-year-old daughter. And uh, he rolled up to, to the house and in he came and we we just got right into the, uh, the the nuts and bolts of what we wanted to do and uh, so we actually started writing songs right there in my uh, living room and uh, uh, it was very easy comfortable uh, no nobody was worried about uh, uh, producing more or less than the other guy the the mission was completed that way and I would say it was a definite 50-50 uh, I was more on the lyrics side he was more on the music side and, and uh, wahoo we got ended up uh, with the, 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 the thing that you, you do is if you have songs and, and, and ideas you got to record them otherwise you'll forget what, what you're doing I trust me uh, that, that that two in the morning where I had a, a couple of glasses of wine, I wake up, I've got this great idea, and I better pee first. This might be a long time. <laughs> and, and then it's gone. When I was done peeing, I went back to bed, and it was gone in the morning. Not not the pee, of course. <laughs> no, oh, it's, I'm glad to hear you have to do that too. We, we all do that, don't we? Yes, and we do. Yeah, so this is it's a 10 track collection, and um, well, each each song seems better than the next, really. It's kind of a combination of Delaney and Bonnie, which uh Bobby Whitlock had been with in the, in, in the past, as well as it, it does sound like some old blues kind of notes from Credence sounding as well, doesn't it? Well, that's a nice mixture of the two, I think, and uh, um. Duck, having Duck on bass, uh, he's on half the songs because he had to leave the project in the middle of it because he, uh, John Belushi uh, asked him to be one of the Blues Brothers, and that's a that's a uh, Duck said so this I I gotta go this is my my dream come true and we said and we all wish you well good for you and uh, we were very happy about for him and he did great the little leprechaun. Amazing. Well, if Donald Duck Dunn, for anybody who doesn't know, had been the uh, the bass player with Booker T and the MGs for a long while, hadn't he? Yes, and I'll bet you uh, not everybody realizes that Booker T and the MGs was the house band for Stax Records. So when you hear Otis Redding's uh, record, the band behind Otis Redding is Booker T and the MGs. Huh? They were uh, producers and uh, wrote uh, songs with the uh, with the different uh, singers Sam and Dave on and on and on and on the list goes on, but Booker T and the MG they were Stax Records. Ah, right. ah, you got huge pedigree between the three of you, quite amazing. And I guess it's no wonder that this album sounds so fantastic. Do you have a track on it that's closest to your heart? Oh gosh, I, 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 there, there. Uh, the good news is there's a difference between them, and and, and that's that. That's a good thing. You're not re repetitive uh, with with your writing or, or or your execution of of the material. So I would have to say uh, I really like uh, "Darkest for the Dawn." Uh, th that I think is the best uh, overall in terms of writing. Uh, but it's not, I'm not saying it's necessarily a single, but uh, I think it was the best, uh, especially now uh, with the, what's going on in the world. Uh, it's, a, it's a scary, kind of a scary uh, good luck song. You know, it's always right. dark. It's pretty dark right now. Yeah, it uh, is, isn't it? Does it surprise you that these songs that you wrote more than 50 years ago are still so appropriate today? You know, it, it, I, 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 not anymore. I, I used to, it used to blow my mind. But then, when you think about it, art Im imitates uh, life, and life imitates art. So, l life is cyclical, and uh, we're in just in, in that area of this, the, the, the circle where 
uh, it's pretty rough out there. Yeah, and everything old is new again, which we can see with the music. It's all, it's very hip to to be producing seventies type sounds now, isn't it? Well, I sure seventies were were real good to me. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> They were, weren't they? Can we talk about Credence and, and the years that you were with that band? And it always surprises me that your contribution was so huge, but you guys were really at the top only before you disbanded. It only lasted about three years. Of course, you'd been playing together since, what, about 1958, um, and and you were all school friends apart from Tom, who was a few years older. Right. Well, you know, who knows what, what the tide will bring, you know, uh, uh, we uh, were on a, uh, as you, you say, quite a quite a, a treadmill. Uh, we we were always recording, uh, bridging the gap between albums with singles in the middle. Nobody did that back then. They said, "You're you're you're wasting a single. It should be there to sell the album." Well, the way it worked, uh, we had these singles in the middle, and then al albums that were singles was loaded. So the the ones in the middle uh, uh, did very well with the ones that were surrounding them. So uh, we were all, always always recording, always rehearsing, uh, and always touring. It's a busy time. I, I wonder how many people realized that you'd been playing as a band for probably around ten years before you broke through and had that first massive hit. It, it was exactly 10 years, and at that time, Tom was the singer. It, it was Tom who brought us in, in to the studio. Uh, he had a band, and they were prototypical musicians. Uh, they, uh, Tom had a vision of recording a couple songs, going to L.A., Los Angeles, uh, Hollywood, whatever, uh, where the record companies were, and to take the demo in and try and get a record deal for him and his band. Well, his band said, are we getting paid? He said, no, it's costing me a fortune um, and my time. And they said, are there going to be any chicks there? No, <laughs> we're going to, uh, it's going to be a re recording session. And they said, we'd rather work on our cars. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> in come the Blue Velvets, uh, instrumental trio, John. Right. You and myself. And he came to us and asked if we'd back him up. And we said, make a record? And he said, yes. We said, yeah, of course we'd want to go. Are you kidding me? And that's how it all started. Uh, Tom was the guy that made it uh, possible uh, with uh, being able to finance uh, uh, a project. And, uh, and also, uh, we were able to... Uh, start recording early with the mindset that you know the, the way you make it is in this business is to have a single on the radio and so our dream was to have our songs played on the radio well they've been playing them for 54 years <laughs> mission accomplished <laughs> absolutely which was the first that got played and what was your reaction when you heard it on the radio well, we uh, were were uh, a band called the Gollywogs for a while. Uh, we didn't give ourselves that stupid name. Uh, the owner of the, of the uh, record company did, but that's another story. Uh, we had a song called Brown Eyed Girl, but, and it wasn't Van Morrison's Brown Eyed Girl. It was ours. And it went, got to number one in uh, re regions uh, in our in the Bay Area where we lived, uh, 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 down south, San Jose was number one, uh, and up in Sacramento, north of, the, of that was it was number one. It was number one in a couple of other other markets, and uh, enough to get us some money. And what we did with the money was we didn't buy a car or work on our cars. We bought instruments, so we were able to uh, get. Uh, new instruments by, by virtue of of, of having a, a record being played on the radio and being played on the radio was great and i was going to uh, san jose state universities at that time Stu and i both what were you studying uh, uh music uh -huh. <laughs> so you were always destined to be a musician I, I got into history for a while, and, I, and, I, and it, it, it was the same subject because history repeats itself. So, anyway, uh, boom boxes were big back then, and uh, in between classes, at any rate, you couldn't play them in class. 
and uh, this guy had his boombox going, and I I hear our song being being played. You know, I came up to him. I said, "That's my my band. That's me playing drums." He says, "It is not." And I says, "That's my band, and that's me playing drums." And he f you, <laughs> he told me, he, he, and I went. God, that's no fun. We get a hit and 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 nobody. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did the name change come about, Cosmo? Well, it came about because we had had to get rid of that silly gollywog name, and so we came up with another silly name, in triplicate, uh, Credence Clearwater Revival. Uh, Tom had a friend named Credence Newball from South Africa. And uh, we thought maybe we would call it Credence Newball. And then we go, well, he'll want to put the action for, for just uh, having his name on it. We don't want to do that. So, but Credence stuck in there and we added an extra E just because if you had uh, the, 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 uh, a lot of letters in your name, it was in boldface type in the newspaper and really stood out. So there was a method to our madness. Right. Uh, a clear water was a a, a beer uh, back then, and Americans don't know how to make beer. They didn't know how then, and they don't know how now. <laughs> Same uh, with coffee. I could, I could go for a nice lager, uh, Australian lager. Come on down. <laughs> We'd love to see you here. <laughs> I, 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 let me finish, or I'll, or I'll forget. <laughs> go for it. Uh, revival was a revival of ourselves. No more u silly uniforms. No more silly names. Well, we got a silly name, but it's a cool silly name. It's it's not woggish, uh, and uh, that's that's how we did it. Amazing. So it was 1969 when Proud Mary hit the airway hit the airwaves, and that was the same year of the Woodstock Festival, wasn't it? Where you absolutely blew them away. Well, uh, y yes and no. Uh, the uh, the interesting thing to me about it, and, uh, and there, here's your study in history, that all the big bands. You know, the, let me go back a little bit further. The the the, the fellows that were going to put the show on had a, a concept, and uh, they're uh, like a brand, but it was hadn't uh, you know hadn't been uh, successful yet they hadn't done it but the idea uh, intrigued us and and what they lacked in, a, in, a, in experience they they didn't and and enthusiasm and they were nice nice young guys and so all the other big big bands were sitting around waiting for somebody to jump and at that time we were number one in the world in record sales and number one in the world in concert draw so we were number one in the world and when we said yes, all these ah, guys. Do ah. Now, here's the interesting part. What happens if Creedence says, no way? Would there have been a Woodstock? Wow. That, well, I, that I certainly didn't know. And I didn't know that you were number one at that time. Yeah. Yeah, we, we were number one. And <laughs> uh, maybe in America, but... Uh, no, I'm, I'm here, here, everywhere in the world. I mean, everybody knew Credence, but I didn't realise it was that early. And, of course, you'd recorded nine of the top ten hits and performed them at Woodstock. Um, yes. Uh, it, it must have been an incredible time for you. Did you get swept away with all the, the fame and fortune? Not really. We were too busy. <laughs> we, You know... And we, uh, we did. We 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 were straight and sober uh, when we when we were doing business, and that meant it, it didn't have to have to be a concert or just anything that were that we were get together doing business on. Uh, no, no, and and if we hadn't been uh, that way, we never would have been able to handle the workload. And, yeah, and I, I, um, I was intrigued to find out that you were all super straight, and the the worst thing you ever did was a beer and a bit of uh, marijuana. How come you didn't get pulled into the whole '60s peace, love, and drugs movement? Well, we were all married for one, uh, and uh, had kids and little ones, but uh, and and uh, uh, our our mission was to make the best records we could. And we saw the other bands in, in town, the Grateful Dead and, and bands like that. They were so high. 
that they weren't even in tune and they were giving each other five coming off the stage saying, wow, we've never sounded better. We've never played better. And <laughs> so we made a pact at the Fillmore West uh, at that time. Uh, this was before we had hits. And we will not, the music will get us high. No beer, no wine, no, no alcohol, wow. no nothing else. And we did that. Oh, a little, a little weed now and then after a show. So maybe Stewie and I might might sneak, sneak out and have a pu a puff. But uh, that you know, it's that was it. Amazing. So I mean, the whole audience would have been off their faces, and you guys were were all straight. Yeah, making but great music. We were high playing the music. I, you know, there's a uh, documentary out on 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 Credence now, live at Royal Albert Hall. Yeah, I know. It. It's trip fabulous. Europe. It was a, it was a big deal because we were playing in the Beatles' house, you know, and uh, uh, we uh, we we wanted to be number one, and we had you know had it a little bit in, in the states, but we wanted to be number one. Well, Paul leaves, and then well, it was you know it was it was uh, waving the white flag. We didn't even have to fight for it, but we we did anyway. We played. I'm an athlete, and uh, and I and I'm com very competitive, and uh, I want really wanted to shine in the Beatles house, and uh, I I uh, had a, 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 an extra focus on that on that show, you know. And I, yeah. and I thought I saw a couple of faces that I had recognized. Well, you you did it. You were you were completely number one in the world. They'd broken up, and and the timing was perfect. What goes through your mind when you look at that documentary now? When you watch yourself play in uh, Albert Hall? Uh, what makes me? I'm 160 pounds. You, know, I, <laughs> you I weren't an keep, athlete then. I was playing like a, you know, was 300 pounds. I was just beating the living crap out of those drums, and that's that's how I played then because I could. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, I've retired from from touring now, and but to get the power that I had then it was was a, a totally a different shift. I used martial arts techniques on, with my wrist to get that power because I was I was you know you, I, 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 you haven't seen probably seen, have you seen the document? I, I've seen some of it. I actually sat down this morning to. Yeah, to I'm, I'm going a, to have a, a slugger, not a boxer, and I would just. People were after they saw it. They said, "Jesus, you just beat the crap out of those drums." I said, "I'm playing rock and roll, man. <laughs> I'm 25 years old. You know, I'm, I have a lot of adrenaline in in, in me, and you know that's what happens. And uh, I only broke one or two cymbals in that in that show. Wow, it's pretty demanding, isn't it, to play drums like that? It's like a really huge gym workout. Yeah, it it is like a gym workout." Uh, no question about it. The difference is you're you're using your entire body, your feet. You're you're sitting down, so you're using your feet, but you're not using them to run. You're using them to play. Bass drum here, hi hat over here, and then the, the, the upper cymbals, hi hats, and ride cymbals, and that sort of thing up here, and tom toms with your hands. And then as the drummer, you're carrying that beat. You, you, you're kind of that base level that's got to keep propelling everybody else forward, don't you? You can't just take a rest for a couple of minutes. Oh, there's no break. No, there's no break. There's just uh, the, the love of what what uh, what I do. Uh, I, I, uh, there's nothing like playing for an, an audience uh, that is definitely into what you're doing. And, uh, you know, that's... Uh, money money can't buy that yeah can you still play like that today no <laughs> uh Stu and i had a band credence clearwater revisited and we broke it up uh, two years ago played did that for 22 years 25 years excuse me but i i i, I was could use my arms to a to a, stint, a, a certain extent, but uh, I found that the, the wrist got, and then I brought the, the the drums in a little closer to my body, so I, I wasn't reaching, and then using the the technique of uh, the, the martial arts to play fine for an old for an old guy. 
it's amazing that you weren't more injured. I mean, I know as a journalist, you get these RSI, repetitive strain injuries from doing the same hand movements all the time. And of course, that's what you were doing every day, every night for so many years. Yeah. Well, um, a nice gene pool, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, must be. I didn't have such luck, for sure. And one of our very favourite albums from Credence was Cosmos Factory, and I believe there's a fabulous story about how that got named that, obviously, yeah. after you. Can you tell us about um, that? Yeah. Uh, my uh, my house, uh, before we had hit, uh, the house I was living in had a gardener's shack, and it was only maybe 12 feet by 6 feet, really small. But it's the only place we couldn't couldn't do it in the garage because it was we, the cops w- would come, and so we tacked uh, uh, cur- rot, uh, rugs on the walls, and and it was in the back behind the house, so it, it wasn't so so uh, uh, crazy for the neighbors. Uh, and but uh, everybody in the band smoked cigarettes, but me. And, you know, so I'm in this little shack and there's no window and I'm playing away and we're rehearsing. And finally, I, I just got up, I threw my sticks on the floor and I said, you guys are killing me with your cigarettes. You know, and I went outside and took a few deep breaths and Tom came out and said, it's better than working in a factory somewhere. So my wife's an artist and I got a couple of different colors of paint. And they've got a, a, a one by four piece of wood that's about that that thick and it was about that big, about 18 inches. And I wrote the factory on it and nailed, nailed it on the door. So when, when we uh, had a hit and had it, money coming in, uh, we rented a, at least a factory, uh, and an old wooden factory, two stories down in the in- industrial section of Berkeley, and uh, you, you, we, we could drive our cars in and we could play any hour of the night or day as loud as we wanted. And uh, so that became that became Cosmos Factory. Oh, what a great story. Thanks for sharing that, Doug. Sure. What do, you, what do you think the success of Credence Clearwater Revival was due to? Because you guys didn't sound anything like what was going on at the time, did you? That's why. Oh, um, we were okay. unique. And uh, and if you put your your history hat on uh, and went and go back to the beginning of rock and roll, that's pretty much what what, what our bare bones uh, 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 attempt was was all about. That's that's what we grew up playing when we were the Blue Velvets, and, and you know when Tom was making these demos and. Uh, back then so when and we liked it you know and uh, we some of it came out of uh, Memphis and uh, you know the, the Sun Records and and then stacks on the rhythm and blues side in in, in Memphis and um, so th- that was what I listened to and I taught myself how to play drums off up the radio and and from records that I would buy uh, and uh, I used my books as drums, set them up, and uh, pencils, and uh, and then a little brass light that had a twisted twist neck, and I would play that. And my mom came in one night and said, "Are you doing your homework?" And I said, "Yes, mom." She says, "Why aren't your pencils sharpened?" <laughs> <laughs> she she cut you out. <laughs> I don't want to poke my finger. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome but, but i was wait. doing homework yeah which proved v- very lucrative in the yeah. end of course she must have she must have been very proud of you did she see your success she she that was what she wanted to do but she got married when she was young 18 and uh and that was her her dream right now on the other hand my dad was the the opposite he hated the music and uh uh, was a bit of a racist, uh, and I was, you know, buying black music, and, uh, and so uh, I, I I only played them when he wasn't around. <laughs> I would play them and put my head next, you know, on on the speaker. <laughs> and, and I didn't want him hearing it because uh, he had threatened to break them. 
Right. So the influences were black and, and from the South. You were in the lyrics, you were talking about bayous and boats and all sorts of things, although you'd never even been down there, to the best of my knowledge. And of course, John was up there uh, in his hillbilly type outfits fronting the band. And I believe he's still doing that today. What was that all about? That's what he likes. It feels comfortable wearing. And, and, uh, and uh, it's also kind of a, uh, a brand. Uh, you know, he, ha he has a certain outfits that he wears uh, and, and on and off stage. It might be a little flashier on stage, but uh, you know, I, I pretty much wore tank tops. You, well, I can imagine you would have been sweating profusely with all that work. You got my hand caught in one of my sleeves and think, it's a little hard to play like this. <laughs> but you were always fit and healthy. You always kept yourself, uh, you, you've always been the athlete that you are today. That's Oh, yeah, that is true. Oh. I had a uh, universal weight machine and, and then uh, 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 dumbbells, lightweights. Huh. And a combination of those two uh, uh, mediums uh, really get a good workout. And then you have to have to run or or, or fast walk. In my younger days, I would run. Now I have I, I have a medium speed walk. I'm 77. <laughs> wow, so. you're doing so well. 77, amazing. You're in 70. awesome shape. That strip. So yeah. <laughs> I remember that show. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how incredible. Um, um, Cosmo, um, the band broke up after just three, well, in, uh, after three years of, of being at the top. Did that come as a shock to you when, when, Tom, when Tom walked away and said he doesn't want to do it anymore? It didn't come as a shock because he was treated very poorly. Uh, and it was Tom was the guy that made us happen. Tom used to be the singer, and he, when John started, you know, getting that voice, he gentlemanly. Uh, he's the older brother too, you know, and running the thing. gave gave the John the vocals and uh, uh, other things. You know, John said, "Don't send, give me any material <clears throat> writing material you're doing." And so he kind of he kind of he was just pushing Tom out, was he? He was taking over. Yeah, and uh, and so I I would stand up for him, uh, and uh, that put me in the doghouse. And uh, I was in the doghouse a lot with with John, but I didn't just didn't uh, it's, uh, right is right and wrong is wrong, and uh, you know he Tom could have he had a sweet tenor, uh, not like John. And so he could have done La, La Bamba or so, uh, we did a lot of cover songs. You know, he didn't have to write it. But he 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 uh, was was owed a, sh a chance to sing. Never got it. And uh, so the, that and other things, uh, you know, uh, from the John was a brilliant talent, but a, a terrible manager and. Uh, that's what put us under. Yeah, that's what Stu told me too. He was telling me all about that, and John drove you really hard, also. Um, and I guess from that from that time, the relationship between John and Tom was completely strained. Uh, completely strained. Yeah, it, we needed a professional manager, a guy that could bridge the gap between the brothers. That was, that was very important. That would, would have solved the, the problem. But then to also have the business acumen where you, 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 know, you know, could go in and knows uh, a, a contract and get us a contract for the number one band in the land, the one, one that was you know fair and, and worthy of what we were doing. I can't imagine what possessed John to think that he could be all to everybody. He could play, he could write, he could sing. And he could handle all the business stuff as well. Uh, and I think as Stu put it to me or, or agreed with what I'd suggested was that he was the ultimate control freak. The ultimate, the ultimate. A plus for, for his creative side, F minus for his business side. I mean, he, he, didn't, he didn't know uh, uh, that he didn't own his songs. 
you know, they didn't look at the, didn't understand the contracts and uh, on and on and on. But uh, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's behind us. Uh, yeah. Uh, didn't but didn't didn't you guys kind of arc up and and try and shape it differently or he was so in control there was nothing that you could do yeah that was that was pretty much it you know uh i i i wasn't afraid of him uh and uh, I, I could get in his face but uh it wasn't going to happen you know it wasn't going to going to change and and you know the good news is you know we have this legacy of music the the positive that came out of all of it you know far outweighs the crap and crap is crap and gold is gold and you know yeah. totally 